Now it's my privilege to welcome our next speaker, Leslie Johnston. Leslie is the CEO of the Lourdes Foundation. Lourdes Foundation is responding to the dual crisis of inequality and climate change by supporting brave, innovative effort that inspire and challenge industry to harness its power for good. Leslie, good to see you again. Thank you. How are you taking care of your body, mind, and spirit during this crisis? Oh my goodness, uh, not as well as I'd like to. Um, trying to keep running, uh, feed my kids healthy food, and take time to reflect um, because we are in the great pause, as I've heard it's called, and uh, we should not squander this opportunity. But I could do more in that space. Great. Well, Please thank proceed. you, Carlos. Yes, and I'm going to share a few slides, so just bear with me while I open those up. Uh, one moment. And um, let's see. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor. And what I'd like to do is share a little bit the perspective of philanthropy uh, in this crisis. Um, because I think that's a perspective that maybe has not yet been shared as part of the Resilient Leaders Talks. Um, it's a very important sector um, in this crisis. Of course, I run a, a foundation called Loudest Foundation, which is based in Europe. Um, and I'd like to share a little bit about what we're doing as a foundation in this crisis, but then more broadly, some of the trends that we're seeing in philanthropy and the role of philanthropy in the crisis. And I think as the Deputy Secretary General had rightly said, we are indeed in crisis, um, but there's more coming. And it's not time to, well, essentially put a pause uh, on the work that's already underway, put a pause on the SDGs, because of course we have the climate crisis, we have deepening inequality, um, we have you know, reduction or elimination of biodiversity. There is a real uh, whirlwind uh, of challenges um, that are not too far away. So now is the time, I think, for us to pause and think about what can we do now to make us better and more resilient to handle these bigger challenges um, that are coming our way. And we are very inspired um, by the words of Kofi Annan uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, when he called for a better system. And the way he said it, I think is very elo eloquent. And I'd like to just bring that back as a starting point is that we need to choose between a global market driven only by calculations of short-term profit and one that has a human face. And I think now with this challenge that we're seeing with COVID-19, we're seeing the effects of a system that has prioritized profit over people and nature. And that's not sustainable, and it's not something that's going to carry us through to where we want to go. Because if you look at the data, it's frightening. We are indeed in a climate crisis. I'm sure many of you have seen this graph, which shows the annual average global temperatures over time from 1850 through to 2018. And the red um, tells its own story but then also the deepening acceleration of inequality that we're seeing globally is frightening. And that's being perpetuated uh, by the system that we're all operating under. So what can we do about that? And how do we react, especially given the challenging context that we're in right now? And I do want to say first a caveat in that Philanthropy is not going to save the world. In fact, philanthropy in its best form can be a catalyst to try to accelerate the work of civil society, of priv the private sector, of government to address these challenges. If you look at climate as an example, total funding that philanthropy is putting in clim into climate is, well, until Jeff Bezos made his announcement, was only about one billion. Um, but the total investment on the public sector side is over 170 billion. Total investment on the private sector side is over 265 billion. So is philanthropy going to solve climate? No, but it can actually play, I think, 
a critical role in trying to change the system. So let me share a little bit of information on Laudis Foundation uh, because we are uh, the new kid on the block. We just launched in January and our vision as a foundation is to work toward a global market that can value all people and respect nature. We're inspired by Kofi Annan's words. We think that there is a different system and a different future for the world that we want to have. And our mission as a foundation is to support that brave action that can both inspire and challenge industry to harness its power for good. Because we believe that industry can be a powerful lever for change, but sometimes it needs incentives, it needs parameters, uh, it needs a little bit of a nudge to make that happen. So that's what we stand for. And just very quickly, our approach as a foundation is really twofold. On the one hand, we're working through industries. So we're, we're working right now in the fashion industry and also in the built environment. But on the other hand, we're working through finance, specifically capital markets. And we believe if you can influence the flow of capital in the system, you can change behavior of the various actors in the system. And our overall goal as a foundation is very big um, by 2030 we want to build and will we'll contribute to building an inclusive economy where essentially mindsets, rules, and powers have shifted so that business and markets not only mitigate climate change, but also eliminate inequality. So that was our big ambition. Um, this is what we communicated about five months ago uh, when we first came out. And then of course, in February and March, the crisis hit. And for me, the COVID-19 crisis effectively laid bare the inequalities of this global system, the system that has created so much opportunity and wealth, but also so much disparity and inequality, and the system that effectively has been perpetuating the climate crisis um, that, to be honest, we have 10 years to address. And I really deeply believe that now is a chance for us to rebuild the system together and so that it can be more just. So this is an opportunity. Now, as a foundation, how did we respond um, when this crisis hit? Uh, first and foremost, uh, we wanted to ensure that all of our staff are healthy and safe. Um, and that is no small order. We have 60 staff members across the world. Um, and that was our first priority. But secondly, our priority was to our partners and to make sure that they're more resilient to the shocks that are coming and that will continue to come. And I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. And of course, business continuity. That's very important for a foundation um, because of the shock, the reduction in endowments um, due to the market changes has led many foundations to either uh, pull back a bit to cancel commitments they've made um, or maybe even stop funding what they had already committed to. Um, and for us, it was very important that we not only respect our contracts, but also continue working under our current budget so that partners have that certainty. So I'll talk a little bit about our partner approach uh, because our partners are really mostly based in Asia and Latin America, and we have a few partners in Southern Africa. And essentially our approach to partners was both financial and non-financial. And I think on the non-financial, I'll start with that first, it was important for us to show solidarity. A lot of our partners are grassroots organizations. Um, a lot of them are you know, dependent on our funding. And we reached out early March as soon as we knew that this was going to impact them. But more importantly, we started to offer flexibility. As a funder, um, we, you know, unfortunately the funder partner relationship is one of a power imbalance. Um, so we immediately started discussing how can we relax deadlines? Um, how can we convert our programmatic grants to more general operating support? We also wanted our partners to strengthen their own resilience. So we have quite a bit of non-financial support in terms of consultants and information to help them develop their own crises plans, to, um, to strengthen their organizations and make sure that they're resilient to future shocks. And then last but not least, we created an emergency fund. This launched about three weeks ago and we essentially in consultation with our partners, worked with them to determine 
you know, where they need funding um, and how can we get it to them very quickly. We relaxed all of our usual requirements and within three weeks we're able to design, implement, launch, run, fund and close uh, an emergency fund, um, which was thanks to my colleagues uh, all over the world um, in being very flexible. Now, what was surprising about this, first of all, the outpouring of gratitude from our partners, I think was really um, heartwarming um, and not all foundations were acting this way. So I think if I could urge, if there's any funders on the line, um, <laughs> it's good to offer money to your partners for unexpected costs. Um, but that is certainly um, one approach that we think has given immediate relief. But what surprised me was the following is that the majority of the funding wasn't actually kept by the partners. It was actually passed through. And it was passed through because these partners are working with vulnerable communities and populations, whether it's garment workers in Bangladesh or migrant farmers in India or immigrants in, in Brazil coming in from, from Bolivia. 67% of the funding was actually given to partners, beneficiaries in the form of food on the table or even PPE. So we're really talking about emergency direct relief. 23% of it went to the working capital of the partners, uh, which is how we expected it to go. And almost half of our funding went to India, where the need is great. I saw there's quite a few people from India on the line, um, and it's very concerning uh, what's happening. And for me, the, the funding itself for each partner who received funding was only about 7% of the total of our grant to that partner. So it wasn't a huge amount, but the fact that we gave it quickly um, and actually with very little, if any, uh, restrictions was very helpful in this time. But philanthropy overall, I think, has a bigger role to play in this crisis. And I think what's really um, positive about the philanthropic sector is that you're seeing a tremendous amount of collaboration um, around the need to react. And you may be aware of this, um, the Council on Foundations in the US launched a philanthropy pledge in partnership with Ford Foundation and other leading foundations, which as of, well, yesterday had 744 signatories. It's probably going up because it's ticking up every day. And for me, this, this pledge, which we have signed, has offered eight promises. And I think if there's a call to action to any funders um, or friends of funders that are on the line, every foundation should sign up for this. Because what these eight promises say is that we as funders pledge to not only loosen or even eliminate restrictions on grants, but also make more grants as unrestricted as possible. We pledge to reduce our asks of our nonprofit partners. This is critical. Um, we have 50,000 cotton farmers that we're supporting. We have a lot of data from the last season that I would love to see, but it's impossible to collect that data. So we are not in a position to ask our partners to go out and put themselves at risk to collect that data. So reduce our asks, but then also contribute financially to community-based emergency responses. And community here is critical. I mean, many of you on the line are leaders in your communities, and we find that getting money to communities, to community leaders is the most effective way to get it where it needs to go. We pledge to communicate regularly and proactively and to listen to our partners. But number seven, and to me this is key, support grantee partners advocating for public policy changes. Now the Deputy Secretary General referred to this. There's an opportunity now to rewrite the system, the policies, the enabling environment under which we're operating. And now is a chance to get in there. And ultimately, we want to learn. We want to learn from this emergency response, which to be honest, is being done very quickly. <laughs> you know, we're really reacting as opposed to thinking for several months um, on how to do this and share um, with others what has made it effective. So that's what we're seeing. And of course, we will continue to see more foundations doing this. And we're also seeing that there are increasingly a large number of resources 
um, available for those responding to COVID-19. And I share a couple examples here. Uh, of course, this presentation will be available uh, for all. Um, but of course, the Council of Foundations has a lot of resources for funders um, and resources to help funders respond in a thoughtful way. Um, the European Foundation Center has a, a list of resources publicly available on their website. Um, and that actually shows a breakdown of what each of the members of EFC are doing in terms of the funding and the trends um, that they're, they're taking. We're also seeing increased help for nonprofits during this time. And I, I put a link here um, that has a breakdown of the different um, relief and support programs that are launching. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot of is there's an increased number of challenges and funds. Um, of course, everyone loves a hackathon, so I think that this crisis has led to a lot of, um, you know, innovation um, and new thinking and funding for new ideas, so there's quite a bit of that. Um, but there's also a lot of interesting awards for young people. Um, last week, I just talked to the founder of the Next Generation Foresight Practitioners Award, uh, which looks for young people 18 to 30 who are leaders in their community, and that's, that's an award that's open now. Of course, we heard about the, the new fund that Ford Foundation launched a couple of weeks ago called the Families and Workers Fund, which is really geared toward supporting families and communities. Um, the European Youth Foundation is running a special call for pilot activities, again, trying to get innovation. And we're seeing a lot of enterprise relief funds, especially for small and, and medium-sized businesses. And I gave the example here of what we see in the UK. So there's a lot out there, um, and I imagine that it will only continue to grow. But for us as a, a relatively new foundation, I do have a specific call to action, both for philanthropy and for each of us as individuals. And I think for philanthropy, now is the time. Um, this is actually a time of opening of minds when we're seeing with this crisis that there is space now in the public sector space to influence the policies that are being drafted, whether it's bailout policies or stimulus packages, if these can be drafted in such a way that are in inclusive, um, that are addressing this deepening inequality, that are looking for green incentives for business and industry, then we will have not only protected ourselves from this immediate crisis, but hopefully made ourselves more resilient for the crisis that will come. But as individuals, we also have a role to play. And I think I, I opened with this, that this is a time for all of us to pause and reflect on what is our role? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for our own actions? Do we really need to travel as much as we do? You know, do we really need to buy single-use plastic? I mean, I know that's a small example, but with you know 7.5 billion people in the world, that really adds up. So I think that it does show that there is a role for personal responsibility. There is also a role for more proactive activism, you know, reaching out to companies that you love and your brands and retailers and asking them, you know, how are they reacting to this crisis? Are they taking care of their employees uh, or employees in the supply chains? You know, we as consumers have an important role to play. We can support movements and coalitions. If there's a way to bring the movement that was emerging around climate together with this and start a movement around a new economy, you know, what does that new future look like for us? That's something I think could be very compelling and something we should all participate in. And finally, if you live in a country that has a fairly, you know, well-functioning government, it's always helpful to push policymakers and influencers to change policy and change it so that it works for the people it supports and it respects nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for this detailed presentation. I'm sure we're going to have a copy of it. Um, so we're well, going to ask you just one question, then we will come back to question and answer uh, after our third speaker. Uh, the question is, how do you see the change in this philanthropic uh, industry post-COVID? What will be the fundamental shift in that industry after the COVID? That's a very good question. And I wish I knew the answer, but I'll tell you uh, my opinion. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is, um, I think there's a couple of things we're going to see. I think we are going to see philanthropic funding on the one hand being hit hard. Um, if, if market movements continue um, as they have, that means endowments are reducing um, and that may mean foundations may pull back a bit. And already we're seeing that. One reason why some of our partners appreciated our emergency funding is because they lost funding from some of their other foundations for that reason. So I could see that being pulled back. And that's why I think it's really important as policy is being written that those incentives are still there for philanthropic giving because once those start getting stripped away, then we see what happens. So that's one thing. But I think that also means there's an opportunity. Um, and there is a movement of foundations. It's really being led by global, uh, Wallace Global and, and others to really look at how do you, given the fact that we have 10 years to address the climate crisis, how do you double down on climate? You know, and foundations of any organization, a foundation should be able to take that risk and increase the spending. So there is an opportunity for foundations to actually start spending down their endowments. It's something that we're seeing already and their commitments out there. Um, and if more and more foundations do that, then that will be an injection of capital um, into the system to solve this very urgent crisis we're in. What do you think the YMCA need to prepare for the after COVID so that YMCA remain relevant um, using the available philanthropic sources? What do you think the YMCA need to do differently? Well, I, I, I think as the, the cartoon showed, uh, we are uh, just at the cusp of a much bigger and transformational crisis. Um, and I think that it's critical that the YMCA's worldwide um, have a view on what they can do in the communities and youth to mitigate the climate crisis um, that's there and to support the building and strengthening of coalitions and movements um, to bring more people along. I mean, ultimately, you know, we do face a bit of a narrative issue um, because I think that the problem is so big and so existential. Um, we just all shut down as individuals um, <laughs> and stick our head in the sand. And there is, I think, an urgent need to, you know, help people be aware um, and activate uh, them. And the YMCA is with your reach, with your youth uh, ambassadors. I actually think that you're very well positioned to play a critical role there. So, <laughs> but the question to you is, uh, one team that came out in this talk is about the young, young people need to lead. How will you recommend or see this happen? Much of the young people are burdened with student debt and lack of capital for starting organization. So uh, how might existing company support or allow young people to lead with existing structure? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think I, I can answer that in the context of the work that we do, which is, is, is quite a, a narrow lens. Um, but I think that, um, you know, first and foremost, in everything we fund as a foundation, it's critical that we bring in diversity of opinions. And that includes having a diversity on boards of our partners. That includes young people and old people. And I, I consider myself in that last bucket, <laughs> older person. Um, okay. But I, I think that there's not enough being done in the corporate world and in industry to bring young people into decision making. And that's just, of course, a function of one's age and experience. But I think more does need to be done. Um, and I think as, you know, we as, as a foundation try to have gender equity and inclusion as part of everything that we fund that includes age uh, in that, and that's an important element. Um, but I think also what's really important is it's sometimes very difficult for young people to have a voice. And again, we work through industry. So I'm going to answer this from a, more of an industry perspective. And what we see happening, if you look at kind of worker voice, uh, which tends to be, you know, more young people when you're looking at workers in places like Bangladesh and India, where, you know, the average age is, is in the 20s. Um, worker voice is very weak. And why is that? Well, the ability to collectively bargain, you know, the ability to have functioning unions, isn't quite there. And I do think as society, we need to do more to preserve labor rights and to 
enable workers to know their rights and be able to negotiate for those rights. So a lot of work that we're funding as a foundation is looking at how do you actually secure labor rights and ensure workers can step up and be part of that discussion. I do think more foundations need to play in that space. Of course, there's a lot of great foundations doing that. Ford Foundation, OSF, um, Rockefeller, many that have been active in the space for a long time, but we need more because labor rights are being eroded and that erodes the voice largely of the youth um, in these industries. Um, so that's how we're looking at it. But again, it's a very narrow lens because of our focus areas.